My name's Lucas. Um, this is Jack. And Tyler, Tyler. Like introduced us. Um, thank you for joining us this afternoon. We really appreciate it. Thanks for the invitation. Yeah, well, you want to start from the beginning? Yeah, we'll just start from start from the top. Um, where'd you grow up? I grew up in the Bronx. Um, in the infamous South Bronx, the home of hip hop. Um, okay. 57 years ago. <laughs> I actually, when I was growing up, I, I wanted to be a baseball player. I was a big uh, New York Mets fan. My dad was a big New York Mets fan, a National League guy. Um, so, you know, what I wanted to do was be a baseball player and be a medical doctor when I was growing up. Okay. What position did you play? I always saw myself as a center fielder. I, I wasn't that good. <laughs> And I didn't get a chance to play a lot of organized baseball. So I, I never really knew how good I could have been or not. Um, but that, you know, when I was growing up, that was just one of my things, right? For me, the the center fielder was always the, the most exciting position on the field. You you were in the South Bronx, but you were a Mets fan. Yeah, that's because my dad was a National League guy. <laughs> and, and, and to be quite honest, when I started following baseball, which was around 72, 73, uh, the Yankees sucks. The, the Yankees were awful, right? Um, so I was by the time they became a good team, except post seventy six, I was already a Met fan. Nice. So, uh, so position like I guess you growing up was music a big part of your life growing up? Oh, absolutely. My father and my mother were both big uh, music listeners. They had a lot of records in the house. My mom had a lot of eight tracks and forty fives. Uh, we had a very small apartment, probably about 700 square feet. Um, but we had a stereo system where we had two mantle sized speakers in the living room, a third speaker over a cabinet in the kitchen, and a fourth speaker in my parents' bedroom. And, and then I had my own stereo system in my own room so that I wouldn't mess with their system. But there was music all over the place in my, when I grew up. I was about 12 or 13 um, when I began to, to first realize it, that what that hip hop was a thing. And it was largely because, you know, there were older cats in my neighborhood, you know, who fancied themselves as part of, of hip hop crews who were out in the park, you know, with their two turntables, a DJ and a bunch of MCs. Um, and, you know, for my younger cohort, you know, I'm 12, 13 years old. You were aware enough of hip hop by that point in time that we started collecting break beats, you know, songs like T Connections, Groove to Get Down, um, Herman Kelly's Dance to the Drum of His Beat, and, and try to do our own little mixes by using the pause button function on, on our stereos. Um, and so, uh, aware enough of it that when Rapper's Delight dropped in 1979, that I was self-aware enough, we could be self-aware enough that we go, hey, that, you know, that's rap on the radio now, right? This mm -hmm. thing that we had been listening to in a park for a year, year and a half, uh, we now, we had then recognized that it made this transition to something else. So that is very much uh, a performative aspect of music, right? The the getting together, creating a community, and then uh, creating beats from a collection that everyone has archived. It's very much like going into like a, a community data bank, uh, like a <laughs> mind, right? Um, what has that given you in regards to uh, like identity? What have you seen um, that has become like an identifying uh, thread through what you've heard? Because you must have listened to Hundreds and thousands, hundreds of thousands of hours of music. <laughs> yeah, it, it does feel like that. Um, and I will say this about those early days, at least with my peers. You know, we we didn't have our own record collections. Like, you know, we weren't out buying records and collecting them yet. What we all did was to go to our parents' record collections. Oh, wow. and literally oh. just start. And and you know, there were times where. Did your, wait, did your parents know? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, not really oh. at all. I mean, that's, that, that, that's part of the trick. Um, and so it wouldn't be unusual for three or four of us to roll up in somebody's house and just go through their, their parents' collections 
so we can try to find some break beats. So that part of it was was very much communal in that sense, right? Or if you found something that you knew your friends didn't have, and, and we know the older cats were doing this on a whole other level, but if you found some break beat that was like really hot and you knew your friends didn't have, right? You couldn't wait to go. You, you got to listen to this break beat that I found on this song and et cetera, et cetera. So there was a lot of experimentation, right? And again, it's in the late 1970s. So we have no idea what this is going to become. We're just doing the thing that everybody else is doing. Can you talk to me a little bit? You keep saying this word, break beat. Break beat. Can you break beat. So, yeah, so, you know, Cool Herc, who many, you know, attribute as kind of the, the, the person that begins hip hop with this party that he gave in August of 1973. He, as a DJ, right, he recognized that there were some parts of the songs that when he was DJing at parties that people reacted to much more strongly, right? He, he would have described it at that time as the get down part. Mm. And and what the get down part usually was were these uh, rhythmic break solos, right? Or rhythmic break sections, you know, in a song um, that really got people amped up, really got, you know, those cats who were doing, um, you know, break dancing, right? That's where the, t the term break dance comes from. Um, these dancers that would dance to the break in the song, right? The get down beat that then got looped by a DJ over and over again. And so when we're looking for break beats, we we're listening to these songs, right, where you would have these kind of breaks, right? So there's a song called Apache um, by the Magic Bongo Band, which is classic, right, because it has all these multiple places where it has these break beats. So there's this really strong break beat at the intro, and there's another one, extended one, towards the middle of the song. Um, James Brown's Funky Drummer. Um, you know, which is kind of a song that people didn't pay attention to when he dropped it in 1970. Um, but it has this strong breakbeat, right? That is one of the most sampled pieces of music ever in the history of music. Right. Um, right. Showing up not just in hip hop, but in terms of pop music and dance music and other kinds of things. So we were all looking for our own versions of the funky drummer beat. We we're looking for our own versions of the, of, of the Apache beat, right? So that we could make our little loop tapes you know, on our cassettes with those breakbeats. Mm. Were there any records that you were particularly fond of that you're like, wow, this is like my go-to Charizard Pokemon trading card. This is the best thing I ever owned. Well, it, and well for me, my favorites were T-Connection has this song called Groove to Get Down. Groove to Get it's Down. At the beginning, and there's another one in the middle that I really liked. Um, there's a group called uh, Freedom that did a song that said Get Up and Dance. Um, that has a kind of bass-driven breakbeat towards the middle of the song that I really like. In fact, Flash and the Furious Five, um, and this is one of the early examples of a group that took a recent song and kind of flipped it in a hip-hop context. But Get Up and Dance by Freedom like dropped in 1979, and by a year later, uh, Grandmaster Flash and the Furious Five had a song called Freedom that was based on that Get Up and Dance bass line, right? which at that time wasn't sampled. It was being played. Um, you know, by musicians in the studio, replicating that sound. So, uh, uh, Dr. Neil, I myself have been uh, great digging for a few years now. And uh, my, I'd say my personal favorite break would probably be Impeach the President. Yeah, I think yeah. that one's kind of just like a, can't really make that sound bad. Um, <laughs> but I was kind of curious on your take on... Um, these new like websites and softwares that kind of generate like um like ai uh, samples and like royalty free samples um what do you think that kind of does to um like sample day you think that's good for it do you think that kind of hurts it a little i'm sure it's good for some people in the music industry <laughs> to be able to it's a good way to put it without having to worry about intellectual property and things of that nature but, you know, as you know, as a crate digger, you know, there's something really organic about that process, about, you know, literally, you know, going to a record crate and flipping through the records and, and the, the mode of discovery that occurs, right, you know, where, when you find that, that beat is like, wow, right, that you know you would have never found if you weren't going through this archival practice of, of digging in the crates. Um, I think there are a lot of younger now musicians and producers who don't have that tactile relationship to digging in the crates 
So the AI thing for them might not matter much, but I'm sure, you know, when I think about someone like Ninth Wonder, you know, who I've had the chance to watch in the studio and do some things, you know, in terms of sampling and stuff like that, I'm sure for his generation and older, right, the, part of the joy was in the discovery of finding something that you knew no one else had heard before and that you could do something unique to it, even if it had been heard before. Mm. That's an interesting point. And I'm, I'm glad you brought up Ninth Wonder because, um, you know, every now and then he'll release something and I'll see some controversy in the community, um, depending on how far back the sample is. Like, um, people tend to be very controversial if it's a new song um, if it, or if it's not off a record. Um, do you think it really matters how old the song is or where it came from? I, I think some of the producers will say that there's a sound quality to older records um, because they were produced in an analog context, mm -hmm. right? To literally hear the scratches, you know, on, on, some, on some samples that brings a kind of different depth of feel to it, right? As opposed to stuff that's been produced over the last 15 years or so. Um, for me, if it's a sample that does something creative to the original, it, for me, it doesn't matter where it comes from. Um, but my own, because my own listening sensibility really pivots to stuff from the 60s and 70s and the 80s, those are the kind of samples that kind of I, I get drawn into. I mean, that's the kind of stuff that gets echoed now, right? We have echoes of that in modern culture with Bruno Mars and Anderson yeah. Pack, that sound of silky smooth sonic. They were trying to emulate yeah. the sound of uh, nuclear America that never really existed, except in Martin Scorsese movies. And I don't know if you can, if you can maybe perhaps attest to this. Uh, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm out of line because I, I don't know because I was born in 1992, you see. So I, I didn't see that era, but I don't think that really existed. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. Um, I, I'm not the biggest fan of Bruno Mars. <laughs> <laughs> no, and, and let me be clear. I, I think he's an amazing performer. I think he's an amazing um, musician. But his music is so blatantly a riff off of late 80s, early 90s R&B. Mm -hmm. um, that I hear it that way, right? I understand why my 20 year old daughter and my 24 year old daughter might hear it differently, <laughs> right? But for me and my taste, right? When I hear Bruno Mars's music, I'm, I'm always kind of like, I've done that already. Yeah. Um, I really do like Anderson Park. Right? Mm -hmm. I, I think he brings a kind of unique sound to it that gestures towards the kind of G-Funk stuff that he grew up in in, in L.A. in the 90s. Um, but it doesn't pander to that sound, right? There's still something very original. And I think the pairing of them together commercially was brilliant because it gave Bruno Mars a kind of street cred that he didn't have. And it gave Anderson Pock, you know, a kind of crossover appeal that he didn't have. That being said, that silky soul stuff, I can't stand that. Same. <laughs> right. And, and and part of it is that, and I and again, I understand why people do, but as someone who grew up listening to New York City radio in the 70s, right? Both black radio stations, um, but for me, more importantly, pop radio stations, where I grew up listening to the style, stylistics and groups like Blue Magic and the spinners, it, it you know, all these kind of R and B slash soul harmony groups from the 60s and the 70s, um, you know, that's really all that they're doing. Um, and, and for me, because a lot of those 70s acts have become so obscure, it's more important for me to really um, bump up their catalog than it is to go over the top, you know, with what Bruno and, and Anderson Park are doing. Plus, you, you just really don't see a lot of drummers who are also elite vocalists. No, that's really yeah. Funny. I mean, and 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 there's some you know really kind of interesting historical stories about that. You know, there's a group um, 
Oh, Jesus. Um, recorded from Motown was like the, the first <laughs> um, white group of Motown, right? They did a cover of Get Ready, um, which actually um, is a cover of a Temptation song. And Cool Herc <laughs> talks about when he heard Get Ready, which is about 23 minutes long, um, there's like the, a long break beat, right? But they had a drummer who was the lead singer. Teddy Pendergrass got started in the industry as a drummer who then moved on to be a lead vocalist. Mm -hmm. um, Jeffrey Osborne, who was a lead singer of LTD for many years before he had a solo career, started his career as drummers, right? So I often wonder if there's something about kind of the maintaining of the beat and the maintaining of the rhythm that if you actually can sing, um, becomes useful when you get from behind the drums and kind of go out forward and lead, you know, lead the song. Yeah, I mean, I think it's useful for any rhythm section uh, person to understand how melody works, right? So if, if they understand yeah. how melody works, they can understand how to have backing right. rhythm as well. Right. Yeah. And the Motown group is Rare Earth. Rare Earth was the first white act that was signed at Motown Records. Rare Earth. Yeah, yeah. I definitely think I've heard of them before. So, not heard so at what point did you kind of start to um, think of your, think of like, academics as a way of preserving the archive like how did it yeah you know so I was a I was a terrible undergraduate student um for lots of reasons in, including you know probably just being a little lazy um so I I never imagined that I would become an academic um and you know when I finally went to grade school went to grad school I only went to grad school really to get a certificate to be able to teach um, high school in New York City. Um, I had no idea I would go on to, and get a master's degree and go on and get a PhD. Um, but one of the things that I felt that I could contribute um, to all of this, you know, once I became a professor and became a scholar and started writing books, um, was my relationship to the archive, right? I, I knew, you know, that. I had a kind of deep abiding passion, you know, for black music that was passed on me by my parents. Um, I particularly had a passion, like, you know, some folks consider themselves like music scholars, right? I'm not a musician. I, I don't play or anything like that. I can only read just a tiny, tiny bit of music. Um, but I was always fascinated by records, right? right? The, the actual thing, right? Um, I can remember in the 80s, right, when, when I first started to have my own money and I get, you know, when I was working summer jobs, I get paid on Fridays and, and my job was in the Soho section of, of Manhattan. And I'd walk down, you know, to the financial district where there's this record uh, store called J&R Records. And I spend 30 or 40 dollars of my paychecks buying records. And then I would get on the train to go back uptown in the Bronx and I would open up those records. And before I listened to any of them, I would read all the liner notes on, on the albums, right? To know who's on it. And like, I would know what I would want to hear in the album based on, you know, who was on it. Like, you know, one of my favorite musicians, the bass is called Marcus Miller. And if Marcus Miller was on an album, like I knew that's an album I had to listen to, you know? And so I always had, you know, a, a, as I mentioned, kind of a deep abiding affection for, records and all the ephemera and all the data that's on records, right? Who's playing on it, who wrote the song and all that kind of stuff. And, and I didn't realize at the time what, that I was, what I was interested in was the archiving of black music, right? And how that archive, that archiving process, curation process takes place in the production of a record. Um, so, you know, it was, I, I would say it's relatively recent in my career and I've been doing this now for almost 30 years that I realized that what my ultimate project was, was this kind of interest in archiving black culture and, and more specifically archiving black music. So speaking of records, um, I'm, I'm curious what your take is on this, like, um, this revamp of, uh, people buying records again. And this like kind of gap in the early 2000s to yeah. I'm not exactly sure what year it kind of came back, but it's kind of clear that people are getting back into buying records. And I'm, I'm curious what your take is on that. I'm sure it's like there's several different angles on that, on why that is. 
I'm surprised. Um, I know what drew people, you know, first to eight tracks in the 60s and the 70s and then cassettes in the 80s and eventually, you know, CDs in the 80s and the 90s was the portability of it, right? You know, you, you could take the music with you because there were these personal listening systems, right? The Walkman and all these kinds of things, which changed how we listened to music and music became much more of a, a personal listening experience. And cassettes and CDs allowed you to do that in a way that an album didn't, right? You couldn't take the album with you in the car as, as, oh, right. as well as that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I, you know, and from the music, you know, from the music industry standpoint, you know, even though they charge more for CDs, CDs were much less to produce. Um, and so I'm a little surprised that folks have kind of gone back, right? But there's always been this feeling that listening to music on vinyl is much more of an authentic experience than listening to it in a, in a digital process. Well, for me, for me, I'm excited about the shift back because that means that, you know, there will be some really good equipment on the market to be able to play records. <laughs> And given all the next new technologies with Bluetooth um, and being able to, you know, digitize vinyl and stuff like that, you know, with record players that exist now, um, I, I finally will have something to do with the 1,500 pieces of vinyl that I've been keeping in storage. <laughs> um, basically, for the last 20 years, you know, when I haven't had a record player to be able to listen to it on. So I guess on the flip side of that, how do you feel about this uh, almost over accessibility to digital uh, streaming? He, it's, a, it's a gift and a curse. Um, it, it allows you to be able to find more stuff, you know, to the extent that someone somewhere thought it was enterprising to begin to digitize some really, really obscure stuff, right? It, it's just simply easier to access stuff it's easier to try to find stuff, right? To find the traces of it. Um, you know, watching television these days, you know, whether it's cable or, or network television, you know, you have to sit there with your little app, you know, to Shazam everything, right? Because you're just hearing stuff, yeah. right? That that you've never heard before. And, and you know that part of the reason why that stuff is being used on television shows and commercials is because it's a much cheaper licensing fee Mm. which means by definition it's obscure right not oh, from wow. well-known artists and well-known music so in that regard you know it, it's it's a wonderful time to really dig deeply into into the archive um but that being said you know there's still stuff that that hasn't made that transition um one of the reasons why i never got rid of my vinyl right and i, and I probably have as many pieces of cds now that i don't use it's because there are things that never made to transition to digital, right? That, that I still want to hold on to, right? In, in the event that, you know, it, it never makes it to digital, right? And, you know, it, given everything that's going on in the world, you know, there's always this fear that one day the cloud's just going to disappear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and you're going to need to still have, you know, physical copies of your digital archive, right? Because it may not be a digital archive anymore. Is there any particular record that you uh, are really looking for that missing from your archives that you would just be like oh, devastated yeah. if it just was not saved? <laughs> like you, you strike me as like an Indiana Jones type. Like this is this belongs <laughs> in a museum. And uh, is there is there a record that you're like, man, if this is lost, like that is that would be just a terrible waste upon humanity. Could never monetize it. Yeah, for me, it would probably be Marvin Gaye's "Let's Get It On." Oh, and and it and it and it's an album that I have two versions of on vinyl, probably three different iterations of it on CD. The um, entire generation of human beings were created to that song. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Ab absolutely. Right. That there used to be this uh, record company called record uh, store around the country called Tower Records, mm 
and they would produce this great little magazine every month where they would review some of the new albums and stuff like that. And they had a section called Desert Island Disc, right, where they would ask a musician or a journalist or somebody, like, if you were stuck on an island for the rest of your life, you know, what would be the five discs that you would have to have with you for the rest of your life? Right. Um, so for me, Let's Get It On would be one of those discs. Okay. That's a good one. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. It was yeah, in it was in Pulp Fiction, you know. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. And, and and quite frankly, the album is more extraordinary than the song. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the song's a great album. song, but the album is is absolutely yeah. extraordinary. Fantastic. And, and kind of on a different angle, but um as an archivist, as somebody who um you know greatly values the physical copy, what are some of the challenges of teaching? courses like the history of hip hop or just course, courses in digital humanities in, in you now? Yeah, I find the, the older I get, the younger the students get. <laughs> um, the, the less they know about the archive. And, and I know part of that is a function of, as I've gotten older, I just know more. But I always feel as though, you know, when I taught students 20 years ago, they seem to know more about the archive than students the same age do now. Um, and, and I know part of it, that is a byproduct of, of young folks growing up now in a period of time where they have access to so much information. All right, so it's really kind of difficult to catalog everything in the way that young folks could 20 or 30, 50 years ago because they had much less information, right, to attempt to, to catalog, right? So, so I know it's a byproduct of that. Um, you know, it's a byproduct of many different places where people can listen to music, right? When I was growing up, there are only a couple of places where you could hear music, right, you know? your parents, you know, or records that you bought yourself, whether they were albums, CDs, or what have you, or radio stations. Um, and if you lived in a metropolis like New York, you know, maybe there were 20 radio stations, <laughs> right? And, and each of them played a particular kind of music, right? But it was really kind of easy, easy to kind of, you know, surf from different radio stations to hear different things, much like television was before cable. Mm -hmm. Right. And clearly before streaming services, you know, now, you know, you could have your own personal discrete listening process and listen to your particular kinds of artists and no one else, you know, could listen to those artists. Mm -hmm. Right. Simply because listening. Right. And, you know, the way all of this stuff works in terms of streaming, et cetera, et cetera, you know, and folks are delivering music to you based on what they think your musical taste is. You know, you have a very limited view of what's out there in the world as opposed to hearing something much more expansive. Um, one of the reasons why I found myself drawn to Pop 40 Radio in New York in the 70s, um, you know, because I love Black radio, right? Love that R&B and soul music. That's what I grew up on. That was the music of my parents. But when I listen to Pop 40 Radio, right, I could hear Marvin Gaye and Chicago, right? I could hear Al Green and Ambrosia. Right. So I got exposed to a wider array of music. And I'm not sure young folks have those same kind of listening experiences because radio doesn't function the way it used to. And most folks don't listen to radio anymore, except for old people listening to talk shows. Right. Yeah. One thing that I was thinking of as you were kind of talking about your, you know, listening, a lot of people listening to their parents archives or their parents catalog first and then moving on to the radio is there's kind of like a mentorship system there. Um and perhaps like you know, like a couple of different levels of it. Um, you know, parents then the radio or the DJ is. Um, but it seems like that's kind of lost now. Um, and that maybe kids are just I don't know how you know your students or your own children listen to music, but I kind of think we're all kind of somewhat I mean, on our own. I, I mean, mean, say. Yeah, I, mean I, I think there's a, there's public curation that exists now on YouTube and on public TikTok, right? There's people that ways. tell you, yeah, there's people that tell you what to listen to, who the kid's going to listen to. I guess me, if it isn't you. And yeah. it's just the people on YouTube that just consistently put on 
uh, these curations that all point towards one direction, towards a narrative that everyone can stomach or accept, even if it's not necessarily the true narrative, but it's the one that hits right down the middle, right? The middle path being the shortest. And right. everyone can kind of gauge in on that. I, I think I, I intuitively understood what was happening when I became a young father. Um, you know, partially because of the relationship I had with my parents and particularly my father with music. I wanted to try to replicate that with, with my children. Um, so I inundated them with stuff when they were young, right? And, and they've all kind of, they both developed their own kind of musical taste. But inevitably, some old song will come on and they'll be singing along. Uh, and, and I'll be kind of shocked. And, and the immediate response is always like, you know, this is the stuff that we listen to all the time. Yeah, right. We're here in the car when we were kids. So I think there's something to be said about that kind of sharing process, right? You know, one of the beauties of, of radio, you know, back in the day is that it was a shared experience, right? If the radio stage radio was on, everybody, every generation in the house was listening to the same kind of music, right? Music has now become fractured in a way that the 17 year old is listening to something that the 34 year old isn't listening to that the 51 of one year old is not aware of, um, you know, because this is the work that I do. I'm a, I'm a little bit more aware of than most 50 somethings of what 18 year olds are listening to. But there's always that moment where we're, my wife and I are watching the Grammys or some BET awards and some artist comes on the screen and she's like, who the hell is that? Right. And, you know, and because I've had the, you know, these particularly my youngest daughters, like I have at least some awareness of, of what that is. Um, but, yeah, that that kind of shared listening experience, you know, amongst generation has largely been lost. Right. Even, you know, Knife Wonder is often talked about in class, you know, in the 90s when he was first really getting into music and, and, and a, something would drop a CD and someone would go out and be the first person to buy the CD or the cassette. And instinctively, you go over to somebody's house and you invite 12 other people around and you all listen to that, you know, that new NWA CD together for the first time. Right. And, and, and you know, folks are making different kind of comments. Some older person walks by and goes, well, that's a P-Funk sample. That kind of process largely doesn't exist anymore. Right. And it was really organic back in the day. Right. Oh. So if it does exist now, it's right, it's something that you have to intentionally kind of put together. What are, uh, as you like, I guess, um, you know, because you're probably, well, uh, you know, working with future scholars as well. What do you think of some of the challenges are the biggest challenges for your, you know, your PhD students and people that are like just the next generations of scholars? You know, the best advice I, I, I can give folks is, right, as they're thinking about the kind of work that they do, do the work that you feel passionate about. And, and not the work that necessarily is going to bring you celebrity. Um, the, you know, the best thing any individual can contribute to this process is your own originality um, and, and their own particular unique take on whatever field of study they're engaged in. And you're going to be doing this for a long time, right? So, you know, make sure you're doing something that you really love that you're studying a subject matter that you really love, you're passionate about, and not just the subject matter that you think is gonna, you know, make you the most money and et cetera. Mm. So I kind of wanted to get back to your uh, personal timeline. Um, so when exactly mm -hmm. did you make the transition from New York to down to North Carolina? <laughs> to Durham? So I, you know, we left New York City in 1991, went to grad school. Um, up in the Buffalo area. I got my PhD from the University of Buffalo, 1996. My first faculty job, professor job, was at uh, Xavier University in New Orleans, uh, which is an HBCU in New Orleans. I was there for a year. Um, I then moved on to the State University of New York at Albany, uh, where I was for six years, from 97 to 9 to 2003. Spent a year um, at the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and I was in Austin when Duke uh, began the process of recruiting me. Um, so I've been here in North Carolina since 2004. 
So I actually haven't haven't really lived in New York City uh, now for more than 30 years since I've lived in New York City. uh, And I haven't lived in New York State for 20 years. But you still identify curiously as someone who is from New York. Oh, no, there's no question about that. It's yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so we took what, you out of New York, but New York is still in you, and it, it's quite yeah. Different. Once once you're from New York, you don't you don't lose it. Um, you know, it, there's there's a kind of pride that comes from, I, I think, growing up in New York, and and for me, it's quite specifically, there's a kind of pride in terms of growing up and surviving the Bronx. I'm from um, Chicago. So that part of it is is, is yeah. never going to leave. Where'd you say you're from? I'm from Chicago, so I understand. So you know. You know, my, my daughter, my oldest daughter lives in Chicago now, and I think she's feeling, she went to UIC, so I think she's feeling more like a Chicagoan. Oh, yeah. And she never lived, she loved, never lived in New York City, We're, and she only lived in New York State for about six years. So for her, it's really just kind of choice of whether or not she's a North Carolinian or a Chicagoan. I think she feels more Chicago these days. Oh, yeah, no, the food will get you. Like, uh, yeah, just don't, like, don't J&J, start the feet to Jack Jackson. Jackson chicken, is finger of... licking, every on, on, on every corner. There's a uh, fish Italian and beef stuff. and deep dish. I mean, there's, and an no. there's an owl's down the street from uh, my, my grandmother's house. Yeah, but neither okay. have barbecues. Neither have barbecues. I mean, why do you need barbecue? Why do you need barbecue? I mean, Raleigh barbecue, <laughs> South Carolina barbecue is vinegar on pork. Why do you need that? No. Why do y'all need that? <laughs> That's right. Silence from both of you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so you arrived at Duke then. You said uh, 2004. That was after you. Then after the uh, your first book, but right before your second. It was actually uh, after my first three books. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, my apologies. And right before my fourth book, the New Black Man was the fourth. Was the right. fourth one. Um, right. And, and and the edited volume that's the joint dropped as soon as I got to Duke. Hmm. The hip hop studies reader. Yep. Do you uh do you listen to any blues like old blues records at all? Yeah, I'm a fan of of the stuff that Chess was doing in the 1950s. Um, um, you know the Muddy Waters stuff. Um, and, and folks like Willie Dixon, Etta James, folks like that. That's that's kind of my my sweet spot. Like uh, um, what about Lead Belly? A little bit. You know, I never had an ear for blues music like that, right? I think part of it is because I needed a little bit more rhythm. Um, so I never really got into deep blues, right? If And if I do, it tends to be some of the older stuff and not a lot of the contemporary blues stuff, uh, though I was listening to Stevie Ray Vaughan uh, a few days ago. You know, what I have found interesting a lot of times in those old blues songs is like, there's this common trope of like deals with the devil or like this idea of uh, giving up a part of your identity over to this higher musical God to become you, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. How do you think that has translated onwards to hip hop to in today's age? <laughs> well, you know, it's it's the old it's the Robert Johnson story, right? That Robert Johnson supposedly sold his soul to the devil at a crossroads. At a crossroads. At Right, right for this for this new technology, yeah, right, yeah, yeah. that no one's ever heard. Um, you know, there's so many different versions of that story, mythologies, if you will, of black music, right? So whether we're talking Robert Johnson, you know, the stories of of Sam Cooke selling his vocal gifts. You know, he started as a gospel singer, and he was really the first one of those gospel singers that really made that transition to secular music. Right. And all the tragedy that he experienced, you know, from 1957 until his shooting death in 1964, there are folks who still attribute that to, right, him selling his voice, if you will, right, to to the devil or the marketplace in this context. Right. So there's always been an element of that in Black music. And and I think you could say the same thing about this in terms of, of hip hop. Um, you know, in the case of hip hop, that you know, the selling of the of the devil of your soul to the devil was this desire for crossover, right? And and in so many different examples prior to hip hop, black artists, while wanting to make as much money as possible and reach the widest audience possible, were always cognizant of not trying to sell out their sound mm-hmm. in order to appeal um, to white audiences. 
you know, hip hop is really the first genre of popular black music where that's no longer been a concern, right? Because hip hop is now pop, right? For lack of a better way to describe it. And if, you know, hip hop has lost its soul in that regard, you know, part of it is the way that it functioned in black communities in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s, right? It, it was a black communal music. It was the music of black youth. It's how black youth communicated with each other. Right. Um, when I talk to young black people now, whether they're my students or my own children, you know, hip hop is just pop music, right? All, all those kind of things that folks talked about in terms of the the four or five elements, you know, the, the break beats, the visual arts, AKA graffiti, the DJing, the rapping, right? The consciousness, all those kinds of things that we think of now 50 years out as what hip hop is. Young folks who listen to hip hop have no relationship to any of that, right? And I think that was part of the price that hip hop paid from becoming this kind of on the margin independent, right? Both in terms of how it's produced, but also in terms of its subject matter, mm. art form that now has, you know, can name a dozen billionaires, right? You know, name Jay-Z and Snoop and Dr. Dre, and we can go on and on, right? And while it's important, you know, that these folks have emerged as the figures that they have, it's important that people get paid and make money for what they do. Um, it's taken hip hop, I think, a long way from, right, how it functioned and how vibrant it was in many communities, you know, 30 or 40 years ago. You're, uh, you're, you're saying that the community that it created at the time was individualistic. And um, I think you really tapped into something when you were saying that uh, when it decided to lose a little bit of that soul of being individualistic for that wider mainstream appeal and turned into pop, um, what do you think it lost along the way? What is this thing that we define as soul? What is what, yeah. is, uh, what is what is that thing that we lost along the way? What is the individualism? It's, what happened? And, 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 you know, and I don't have a direct answer for that other than knowing that you, you just... You just know when a thing has lost its soul. <laughs> you, know, you, just, you, you just know when it doesn't matter anymore to people the same way it mattered 20 or 30 years ago. Mm. Right. You know, for my generation, folks a little older than me and also folks a little younger than me. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, Ninth Wonder and I, I'm 10 years older than Ninth Wonder. So when I'm talking about folks a little younger than me, I'm thinking about folks, you know, in, in Ninth Wonder's cohort. You know, hip hop was something that you lived, right? Hip hop was something that you were about. It, it wasn't just some music that came on the radio, right? It, it was the way that you viewed the world, right? It's the way that you carried yourself in the world. I don't see that amongst young folks, right? Even if they're into hip hop, right? It's not that anymore, right? And so, and, and while I'm willing to acknowledge that everything has to move on and develop and become something else, right? That's natural progression, right? And, and clearly hip hop is going through that progression at this point in time, right? But the, the thing that I grew up with, that's not what it is now. So what are your, I guess um, something that's kind of like struck to me is the dialogue aspect of it and the community aspect that's being lost. I are like in not having those shared experiences of listening together and kind of losing some of the soul. Um, what are your concerns, I guess, in terms of what that means for like, I mean, black communities in particular, like how that affects community building experience. Yeah, um, yeah. Performative aspects of community building and experience. So, you know, hip hop was social media before social media. Yeah. Right. If, if you wanted to get a message out to young black people in the 80s or the 90s, you, you put it in a rap song. Um, you know, when when Karis One was concerned about what was happening in K through 12 education, right, as it related to black <laughs> folks, he, he put it in the music. You know, Chuck D and Public Enemy schooled a whole generation of folks on the Black Power Movement, 
right? And and the Black Arts movement, right? I, I keep thinking about a song like Rebel Without a Pause, which was dropped as a 12 inch in, um, you know, 1987. And this line where he goes, you know, I'm a supporter of Chesimard. And, and there was a whole generation of folks who had no idea who Joanne Chesimard was, right? Even as she was making that transition from Joanne Chesimard to Asada Shakur, right? Who, of course, has been in exile in Cuba, you know, for the last 40 years. I mean, they were educating people with this music um, at a time when K through 12 might not have been doing it, right? So you might not have been getting it in school. Um, you, there weren't the kind of community institutions where that information would be passed on, but hip hop was social media. Hip hop was the public square, right? You know, when Karis One decides we have to deal with something on black and black, black on black violence, and he does a song like Stop the Violence, right? That wouldn't have worked as a documentary <laughs> in, in 1988 or, or a news story, a special report on CBS right? You put it in the music, right? And I don't think that, that hip-hop has that same kind of passing capacity now. Even as individual artists themselves might be more blatantly political and have their political platforms. Right. Right. But the music doesn't necessarily deliver that information the same way. There's a difference between protest and politicis- politicization, right? Like politics right. and protests are different, right? Correct? Right. Can you and, and hip-hop is- Hip hop did both. Can you outline um, the difference was, between uh, what protests would be and what political might be? In this moment? Sure. <laughs> so, you know, I, I, I'll use an old example, right? You take Public Enemy's body of work, um, takes a nation, particularly it takes a nation of millions to hold us back. Um, Fear of a Black Planet. You know, this was music. These were songs that were an attempt to educate young folks about political uh, realities. But then you take a song like Fight the Power, right? And and you literally look at the music video for Fight the Power, right? Which is shot in Brooklyn on a Saturday, 1989. And it's presented as a mass protest rally. Right. And literally there are folks in the crowd holding up signs about particular political leaders and different kind of slogans from that period of time that attempts to replicate for a new generation the March on Washington. And right. In fact, the the full video, which is directed by Spike Lee, starts with this news clip of the March on Washington. And then Chuck shows up on screen and says what happened back there was a bunch of nonsense. Right. You know, this is what political protest and activity looks like at this particular moment. Mm. And because it was so closely in line to what was happening in New York City politics at the time, the death of Yusef Hawkins. Right. In, in the summer of 89, um, the death of someone like Eleanor Bumpers, Michael Griffith, Michael Stewart. Right. Who was a graffiti artist who was killed while tagging. Right. Being by, while being hip hop in the subway station, he was killed. Um, Those were really subtle kind of distinctions, right? So Fight the Power is an effort at mass protests, right? While their music is doing a process of educating people about political realities. Mm. Okay. So do you think like the the accessibility of music consumption kind of has something to do with when you were talking about the loss of soul in music? Yeah, there's no question about that. Um, and, and again, I, I'm not anti-technology. I'm not anti-access. I'm pretty anti-technology. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't like it at all. <laughs> For that reason, that's why I asked it. But we we don't have, all right, and, and we talk, you know, for me, there's a lack of a vetting process, right? And And I understand how, talking about a vetting process in and of itself, you know, almost gestures towards a kind of hierarchy, right? Telling folks, this is good music, this is bad music, you know, whatever, ever. And and I don't necessarily mean that by a vetting process, right? But I do think there should be a vetting process on what matters to a community 
based on the community standards. Mm. Uh, and so, you know, when you look at Showtime at the Apollo, right, which many folks have seen as kind of a late night television variety show, right, that's existed in many different iterations on television for the last 30 years, right? But the essence of Showtime at the Apollo, right, is the Apollo Theater Amateur Night, which goes back to the 1920s, where folks would come on stage to perform, tell jokes, sing, what have you, dance. And the community of folks in the theater at the time, right, which was very diverse in terms of the social classes of folks who were there, right, they had a role in deciding what was good and what was going to represent Black culture going forward. So if you got on stage, you couldn't sing, that audience would tell you, you can't sing. Yeah. And unless you double back and came back with a different set, a different skill set, right, you would never go forward. You know, Luther Vandross, arguably the most important and the most gifted R&B singer of the 80s and 90s, right, lost Amateur Night at the Apollo seven times, right, before he finally came back with a style that folks were like, okay, right, right, we, we can appreciate what you're doing. What has happened over the last 30 or 40 years, and hip hop is the best example of this, is that you know record companies and producers and managers can pluck people out of the community, give them a recording contract, right? Support their careers without that vetting process ever occurring, hmm. right? So we can hear music now on the radio where 60 years ago, anything that you heard on the radio that we would call quote unquote black music, it had already been vetted through these community or institutions, right? Public spaces where folks perform music, traveling on the Chitlin circuit and doing live music and all those kinds of things. There was a vetting process in place that has largely disappeared, right? Because now the vetting process is now, you know, how many TikTok followers do you have? How many SoundCloud drops do you have, et cetera, et cetera? And that's how record companies decide, well, this is why we're going to sound, sign you, not what we think your relationship is to the community that produced you. I think, yeah, I think you made a really interesting, like the point that I'm taking this great is um, essentially that I think people, when they hear vetting, their initial thought is hierarchy. But in reality, mm -hmm. it's twisted where the hierarchy is now doing the vetting and where it used to be community. Um, yeah, yeah it's just really okay. an interesting uh, avenue. But I, it, it's something I was thinking about, and I read the first two chapters of Black Ephemera, your most recent book. Um, in the second chapter, you talk about Trouble in the Water, um, mm. the documentary, and mm -hmm. it's the many uses of like um, hip hop and sampling and how the. Mm -hmm. uh, and what I'm thinking of on that is what do you think the importance of video is to preserving the archive or in different forms? I mean, that's a documentary, but just like different, uh, different mediums. Yeah. It, it, it's important now because I think black culture definitely, but as a nation, you know, we were once a reading culture, right. Where the culture was defined by what was in print. Um, I think there's a period of time in the post-World War II period of the 50s and the 60s, you know, we became a very audio culture, right? When you think about the significance of music that was produced in the 1960s, specifically for people to be able to listen to in their radio, in their cars, on their car radios and things like that. Um, I think we've made a transition now to a very visual culture and not just in terms of the moving image and television and, and obviously in terms of film, but also what we're seeing in terms of, of Instagram and TikTok, right? It, it's not surprising to me that, you know, where Twitter is essentially a linked based technology and, you know, Facebook is more of a text based. And, you know, that's the same thing also with Twitter. But the things that really have taken off in terms of social media, in terms of Instagram and, and TikTok are really anti-text, right? It's not about reading, right? It, it's all about watching, right? And, and how you process things watching. So I think it's important to think about a way to be able to continue to archive the, the, collect, uh, the, the, the archive 
you know, black music and other things by using these kind of visual mediums, you know, that are very popular at the moment. Um, I'm really glad you brought that up. Um, I had a few questions about that. Um, there was a song that was released by a punk band in the early 2000s called Video Killed the Radio. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty much what we're, exactly what we're talking about right now, how <laughs> artists kind of care more about the visual than the audio part of their music, even though it is music. And uh, in your book, um, The Songs in the Keys of Blues, you talk about a lot of like black R&B musicians are kind of hyper, hyper sexualized. And like yeah. the, the perfect example I can think of is uh, D'Angelo <laughs> and how kind of how his career you know, ended up, and I kind of wanted to hear your two cents about that, because I've always thought about, you know, what if, kind of like the Michael Jordan, like, what if he hadn't quit? What, what could yeah. He I, I, I think D'Angelo would agree yeah. that that Untitled video was a turning point of his career. Absolutely. Because there's a way in which, as an artist, he became more well-known for having his shirt off right. in that video than he was even for the music that that video was shot in support of. It was incredible literal music, incredible right. music. And I think for him, and, and again, at a period of time when the culture is, is making this kind of, kind of transition, right? D'Angelo, in my mind, saw himself as part of this earlier, earlier generation of musicians whose reputation was based on right the music right but he hits at a time when the culture is transitioning from yeah the music is important but how do you look right right and i'm sure there's some point in d'angelo's career where he's like i'm never going to look like that again yeah. simply because i'm older and and whatever was going on in my life all these kinds of things that in his mind may have been an impetus for him to continue to make music right i don't know that that's the case when i'm just just speculating here. And so to your point, you know, about video, you know, kill the radio, there's an argument to be made that social media has killed the music. People don't get signed because they're great musicians, right? You might be a great musician, but if that can't translate to TikTok and IG, right? And in fact, we're not even going to have a discussion with you until we can figure out how many IG followers you have. I often use basketball as a good example of this when people are trying to process the phenomenon of, of Zion Williamson's one year at Duke, <laughs> right? And what that whole phenomenon was about. Well, you know, part of it was that he had a million IG followers before he even walked on Duke's campus. Yeah, I was going to say, I knew who Zion Williamson was when he was in yeah. eighth grade. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. And so, you know, there's a way in which record companies, right, who are always in the business of figuring out what's next, which is really not about figuring out what's next, it's figuring out how can we make money off of controlling what's next, right, are, are interested in what kind of image or sound or lifestyle, right, will contribute, you know, to us signing an artist that can be able to carry us in that sense, whether or not they have good musicians or not. What it also means is that we have a lot of young folks who get involved in the record industry as a starting hustle. Yeah. So let me do this music thing first, build up my IG followers, and then I'm going to move on to other things, right? It might be acting, right? It, it might be this brand stuff, whatever the hell young people do these days. I can't keep track of, of, of all this, right? When, when folks are like, I'm a brand ambassador, what the hell is that, right? But anyway, <laughs> um, you know, folks are not in the music game for the long haul of being musicians, right? When, when we interviewed Knife Wonder for Life to the Left of Black a few months ago, that was one of the points that he made, right? That, did young folks get in the music industry not with the idea that this is going to be their thing for the next 25 years, right? No, it's just the start of hustle, right, at the beginning of a career of hustling, right? So, you know, it becomes the music industry and maybe we'll do a podcast and then maybe we'll write some self-help books, right? We'll do a documentary, right? We'll do a docu-series. We'll get a series on Hulu. I mean, it's all of that stuff. 
which takes people away from the music, right? You know, and, and there's lots of reasons for this, but when's the last time Rihanna made an album, right? You know, we're, we're more likely to be concerned with what's going to drop from Fenty next mm -hmm. as opposed to, you know, the next record that's going to drop. Yeah, I'm really, yeah, and I'm also glad you talked about uh, Zion because that was, it's like also an unrelated, related thing because I think there's a very similar issue in sports when you have like, People who are like 11 and 12 getting recruited for universities before yeah. they even yeah. know how to like tell time and stuff. Um, but like kind of a second part to that, um, D'Angelo question, do you think maybe if he were produced in a different generation, he might have been more successful or he might have had a longer career? Maybe it, he just maybe have been in the wrong generation. Yeah, I think he would have because he would have been around more like-minded musicians um and not that quest love and the roots you know in and of themselves aren't you know like-minded musicians but in many ways they're outliers amongst this generation um you know had d'angelo come through 30 years before you know those like-minded musicians wouldn't just be in his immediate crew but all throughout the industry right you know and so i think you know he would have had an infrastructure, right, an ecosystem, right, to be more successful, right, right, where there wasn't the pressure on how he looked. <laughs> like the one of the most successful and famous soul singers in the 1960s was Solomon Burke. Solomon Burke weighed 800 pounds. Damn. Right? That, that's He's a big guy. That, 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 that's all you have to say, right? You know. Dang. He wouldn't have been able to survive, right, as a musician in this era, right? You know, he was able to survive, you know, back then because it was all about who Solomon Burke was and the voice and all this kind of stuff. Probably overstating how large he was, but he was a large man. Um, <laughs> I have to for because I don't think any human can get to that size. Yeah, right? Probably more like 400 pounds, right? And he couldn't travel by air, right? They had to cut out the back of the car for him to be able to travel, um, Duke used to have a a, a weight uh, center. He would come to Durham fairly often to go through that. I mean, this is a fairly well known story, right? But his size, right? Luther Vandross, right? Luther Vandross. One of the reasons why he it took him a while to connect with record industry folks because because he was too large. Um, so imagine what that would have looked like in this era, right, where everyone is consumed with how folks looked, right, and filters and all that kind of stuff. One thing that arose to me as you were kind of talking about, um, like, well, just through the chat, talking about first the community that you had in the Bronx, then working with people like Ninth Wonder, is that they kind of, well, they treat, it is a career, it's a lifestyle, it's a way of living. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas now you then were talking about, which is true, about like influencers, uh, building a brand, the music is part of something else. It's not right. the music itself. Um, right. What do you think that impact has on like the ownership of the archive, I guess, or, or like on uh, how that, because it's, as we've kind of talked about, it's more hierarchical perhaps than ever and more vetted from the top. And that has to mean one, the dilution of the, the voice perhaps, and then also ownership retention issues you know what becomes really successful in the music industry is that thing that sounds like the thing that you just heard and and it means that we've created a generation of of young artists if you could call them that um who matter to us because they sound like a better version of the thing that we liked last week or two days ago, right? And the record industry breeds itself on that kind of sameness. Um, whereas 50 years ago, regardless of the genre, you know, folks had really distinct and unique voices and sounds and things of that nature, right? Stuff that even if you didn't own it in a traditional sense, you had cultural ownership of, right? Because you could say that that's my style. Right. And I might not make any money off of it, but it's mine. Right. And, and people know that it's mine. 
And then the ownership piece to the actual ownership of the music, right? Because when you create all this sameness, what is there actually to own? <laughs> Right. If you sound like five other people, what what kind of claim can you make on ownership in that context? And that, I think, also informs the way that we think about the actual ownership of the music. You know, Prince walking around 30 years ago with slave and master, you know, written on his cheeks. Reporters asking him what that's about. And he's like, because if you don't own the masters as in master recordings, the master owns you mm -hmm. um, and, and in the number of musicians, right. Who, who did not have ownership of their master recordings or ownership of their publishing. Right. And of course there's a whole history in the fifties and sixties of black artists who were denied publishing rights for writing songs. But when the records come out, you know, record label owners and producers and managers and all these other people, show up on the record so you don't get any royalties from that. Willie Dixon, right, for all the songs that he wrote for Chess Records, had to sue them, right, for that very reason, because he didn't get credit for what he wrote. Young folks now, I think, are so invested in the hustle of the recording industry that those kind of details aren't necessarily important to them anymore, right, because it's a mean to the end, right? It's a means toward building their brand. And if you're not actually creating anything all that unique, you know, what exactly is there to own in that context? So speaking of ownership, um, you know, you obviously talked about how there's constant battle between um, record labels and um, business people and artists. And I kind of wanted to, I thought it was a perfect time to bring up uh, De La Soul. Yeah. And uh, I would consider their recent um, physicals a win for hip hop, um, RIP to True Glory. Dave, um, do you think that maybe this big win for hip hop is like maybe a start of a transition back towards artists being able to own their music more so than the companies? Or do you think this is just kind of a small blip? Yeah, so I think it's a victory for a generation of artists like Poss and Dave, Maceo, um, groups like A Tribe Called Quest immediately come to mind. Mm -hmm. You know, Three Feet High and Rising is an album that you couldn't make now. Even if you would get the clearances for all the samples, the cost is prohibitive. Yes. Pay out what you would have to pay out. And there's a way in which that train has left the station, right? We're, we're, we're never going to go back to a moment where you can produce a three feet high and rising, or it takes a nation of millions um, to hold us back. The, the industry just doesn't support that, right? It's not financially um, manageable in this context. You also don't have producers who are equipped to do that work anymore. Right. Yeah, that's true. What's most important about the De La moment for me, right, and, and I'm, you know, one of these folks that, you know, for all the folks decrying not having access to their archive, um, the only ones that I didn't have physical copies of or digital versions of uh, was De La Soul is Dead. Um, so that's the only one I really missed, right, in that sense. That's actually the only one I have. Just <laughs> I think to be able to reintroduce a catalog that has been talked about for so long that a bunch of young folks didn't know about mm -hmm. and now have it available for them, um, I think it's a chance for a birth of a certain kind of creativity within hip hop. All right. Because this is the thing. I'm sure the baby, <laughs> little baby. Young Thug, <laughs> I could go on. I'm sure they have no idea who De La Soul is. Yeah. And don't care. And that's fine. Um, but there's going to be some young person who's interested in what hip-hop was. Mm 
and wants to take the, back to that moment. And, and De La Soul, the reissue of their catalog, will be building blocks for that. Right. I'm sort of somebody who wants to take hip hop to Little Brother in 2003. Mm-hmm. And De La Soul will be building blocks for that, right? Wants to take it back to, you know, people's instinctive travels, right? You know, the, the first Tribe Called Quest album, right? And the Daylight catalog will be a building box towards that. So in that regard, I think it's a win for creativity and hip hop, right? Even if I don't think at the moment it'll directly impact what we mostly hear, right? That's labeled as hip hop. Do you think hip hop will some at some point reach that point again of maximum creativity and freedom? I, I have quite frankly been surprised that it has survived as long as it has. <laughs> right? And I don't mean that it would ever go away. Um, but, you know, the history of Black music is that some genre becomes vital and it becomes overly commercial and folks move on to something else. Right. Bebop moved on to hard bop, right? The blues moved on to rhythm and blues, rhythm and blues, gospel moved on to soul, soul moved on to funk, funk moved on to hip hop. Uh, I'm not sure what hip hop has moved on to yet. Right. And, and personally, when I first heard 50 Cent in the club, <laughs> and I watched the video, Right, about the creation of the bionic rapper. Right, I mean, this song is telling us about the future of AI before we even process what this is, right? I grew up watching the Six Million Dollar Man, right? I knew what the bionic man was, right? So the video is based on the idea of this television show from, from the 1970s, right? You know, the, the bionic man. And it's like, we can build it, right? He'll be faster, right? He'll have better flow, et cetera, et cetera. It's like literally the creation in the laboratory of the next generation of rapper. And I was like, okay, I'm done. <laughs> I, I, can't, I, I can't fuck with this no more, right? And and ironically, right, I hear in the club now, and I have a kind of nostalgia for it. <laughs> it, 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 it still felt like hip hop, right? Some of the stuff that I hear now doesn't always still feel like hip hop to me. What doesn't feel like hip hop to you anymore? You know, what did you hear recently that just infuriated you and, <laughs> and hurt your heart? What hurt your heart? So, like, this is a funny thing, right? Like, what I'm not you? actually anti-mumble rap. I, I think mumble rap does something that's actually really fascinating, right? You know, what happens when the stories of the music are so overexposed that you have to find a way to filter what you're talking about? Right. So in that regard, for me, listening to mumble rap is no different than listening to five percenters in rap in the 1980s. Right. It was both a filtering process to filter exactly what the hell we're talking about for a culture that's becoming overexposed. Uh But, you know, I'm also someone who is devoted to lyricism. I'm devoted to flow. I'm devoted to wordplay. You know, my. You know, if I'm thinking about, you know, what's that thing in, in Idaho or Washington with the four presidents on it? Mount Rushmore. Uh, thank you. Right. If I'm thinking about my, my Mount Rushmore, <laughs> you know, my Mount Rushmore has Rakim and and probably Jay-Z and and, and probably Queen Latifah, right? If if I'm gonna be gender equity at this moment. Um, and I, I probably would, for my own personal taste, have to throw Farrell Monch in there. Um, I'm not hearing that now, right? You know, what sounds like hip hop or matters most to hip hop to me has moved on, right? And that's fine, right? They're not producing music. You know, the mainstream of hip hop is not producing music for my 57 year old ears. Yeah. Right. And, and again, going back to the De La moment, right? The, the fact that it's also now creating a moment where we can comfortably look back in the archive of hip hop, right? And, and reassess some of what was done 20 or 30 years ago. For me, that's a victory, right? But I, I can't continue to think, 
that a recording industry that is largely premised in producing music, I'm not just talking about hip hop, for 12 to 27 mm. years, right, at this moment, um, is also producing music for my ears, right? So, so I have to do a different kind of labor to find music that speaks to me. Mm. So how do you think like somebody, like a producer like Ninth Wonder or maybe even the Alchemists have able to preserve their sound for so long and still keep a young audience and the old audiences together? It, it's, it's the Danny Glover theory. Yeah. And, and so Danny Glover, most folks don't know, um, for most of his life has been a black radical had very black radical politics. And he picked and chose the kind of projects that he could do to finance his radicalism, right? So on the surface, those Lethal Weapon movies, which made him a star, really is a bunch of bullshit, <laughs> right? But it allowed him to executive produce and produce other kinds of films and documentaries, right, that mattered to him. What I see with folks like the Alchemist and Ninth Wonder, you know, they do certain kinds of production work. Beyonce, Mary J. Blige, right? Those are the two of the projects that that won, you know, ninth Grammy Awards. Um, you know, Kendrick, right? You know, for that one track um, on, you know, the album that, you know, won the Pulitzer they make kind of strategic choices about the kinds of artists they want to make because it gives them a kind of broader platform. But at the same time, remaining committed to producing the kind of artist that speaks to the integrity of who they are, right? So for Ninth Wonder, whether that's Rhapsody uh, or, or the young kid that just dropped, um, it allows them the flexibility, particularly through Jamla, in the case of Ninth Wonder, to make the kinds of music that he wants, right? Including the Zion projects, you know, which, which he's dropped, I think Zion 8 just dropped. Um, you know, what they're, what it speaks to, and I've heard him talk about this, John Caramonica, the New York Times has talked about this. You know, you can live a very nice middle-class lifestyle as a hip hop artist and not have to sell, go multi-platinum, not have to tour all over the country, not have the number one record in the country, but just make the kinds of music that you like, that has a kind of integrity to it, that speaks to the audience that supports you, right? And there used to be a time in the music industry when an artist could do that and not feel the pressure to change up and become something bigger, right? And that's something bigger, I think, when all is said and done, it's tied to the development of music video and what the industry has become since the 1980s. Right? If you're Michael Jackson and you sell 30, 30 million copies of Thriller, what the hell do you do next? And, and I would argue he spent the last 20 years of his life right, trying to find a way to deliver the bang of the 30 million copies that he sold in that period of Thriller, right? So the videos become crazier. How he physically looks becomes crazier, right? The dropping of a music video becomes like an event. I mean, everything that Michael Jackson goes through for the rest of his life as an artist, right, is in response to the fact that I can't drop another album and just go gold. It's that like ghost right? you know? yeah. Right. And it's like, you know, you can't go back to that. Right. And then you're looking at other artists who are like, well, I want what Michael wanted, what Michael had. Kanye. Right. And so, so to just be the, the, the artist, right. The, the singer songwriter in the spirit of Carol King, who just writes some great songs, gives some of them away to folks like Aretha Franklin, but also will do a great album, you know, on her own. Right. Those kind of sensibilities, I think, have been lost, at least in mainstream pop music, right? We still see it in jazz. I'm sure we see it in folk music. You know, even as country has become highly commodified and commercial, right? I'm sure there's some country artists, right, who are still just kind of doing it for the love of the music. 
word that kind of comes up to me as thinking about that is just like service or like within community. I mean, in the sense of uh, just that, I mean, you don't have to pursue, you can pursue the art with the humbleness and create something that is worthwhile and make money off it and not have to pursue sure. the 30 million. Yeah, be reasonable. Right. And, and if you have that breakout hit, just ride with it. <laughs> right? and, and then go back to do what you do, right? To the audience that, you know, is this great line in this film, Five Heartbeats, um, which is about a fictional, you know, R&B group that comes up in the 1960s, right? They're having this conversation about crossover. Um, in this context of the film, it's based on a, a true story where the Isley Brothers did their first album for Motown. Um, and on the cover of the album were two white people on a beach. Right, because they were trying to cross them over, right, to white audiences. And there's a line in the movie where one of the characters is like, you know, you know, crossovers a double cross, right? Once we cross over to white folks, right, we're never going to get back the audience that we lost in crossing mm -hmm. over, right? And and that's been the case, right? So when you do have that great crossover moment, right, you don't double down on that, right? You go back to the stuff that got you to that point in the first place. Do you guys? I think that's about good. Yeah. Honestly, we uh I don't think we have many more questions. We really appreciate you talking to us, honestly. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. That was extremely important. You're welcome. Yeah. Um do you have any events or plugs that you want to put in? No, well, I'll be at the Prince Conference. Uh NYU has been doing a Prince conference for about six years. Um, and we're back to in person. So the Beginning of April, the March 30th to April 2nd, uh, there'll be this wonderful Prince conference at NYU that I'll be presenting at. Nice. Uh, and we encourage people to go listen to your Left of Black podcast. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, that's, that's really it. Um, well, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gabby. Thank Talk you. I enjoyed this combo. Take yeah. care, y'all. Another rendezvous at the forum with Dr. Mark Anthony Neal. Have a great one now. Thank you.